mentioned, I've been with the University of Houston for um, about 35 years, actually, just uh, officially retired but still connected with the program in Foresight at the University of Houston. I've also uh, taken on and had been taken on, but now I have more time to pursue what I call Foresight Education, which is the attempt to introduce futures thinking into the what I call the rest of education, which of course is a huge process. Uh, all the high schools, colleges, professional schools. I believe that students really should be acquainted with the future. Uh, the vision for my initiative here is that we teach as much about the future as we teach about the past. Uh, knowing about the past is valuable, but uh, except for a few rare individuals, most of us will live in the future. So uh, being prepared for that would be something. So that's Thinking about the future took a gigantic leap forward in science fiction, uh, both in particularly after the Enlightenment in the 19th century, and people were thinking about alternative futures then, though they were highly fictional. Uh, science fiction is, is very much the same as future scenarios. The big difference, however, is that science fiction writers are not encumbered by the need to be plausible. Uh, basically, they can start a science fiction story or movie or something in a universe and in a world that is quite different from our ours, and they do not have to connect it to ours. So, but future scenarios have to be connected in some kind of plausible series of steps. There still may be surprises, and it requires a great deal of imagination, but it is not just leaping out into space and saying, oh, now we have a planet, and here we go with the science fiction story. So the, the two have a similar purpose in that they, bo they both challenge the assumptions of the present and the expected future, but the scenarios tend to be more plausible than the science fiction does. Well, I chose uh, Stan uh, Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey for this discussion. Uh, it was a movie with, in the late 1960s which truly inspired me about the future. The historical context of that movie, of course, was the heyday, the golden age of space travel. Uh, the United States was in a race to the moon with the Soviet Union, and the Apollo program was gearing up and, and were getting ready to, to go to the moon. So, of course, we had very, very optimistic scenarios and ex expectations for the future of space. There are private enterprises today which are uh, beginning to launch satellites into orbit, um, and there are even people who are trying to figure out how to build kind of very um, inexpensive space stations. We do have the, the, the chance that this coming year there will actually be the opportunity to purchase a non-orbital uh, ride in space on, on Spaceship One, on Virgin Galactic's uh, spaceship, which they won using the XPRIZE. The 2001 Space Odyssey did kind of set that tone of a very long-term uh, look into the future, and obviously space travel was a very big deal in those days. The other things that attracted me to that movie and why I selected it was that it also showed the gigantic sweep of time because uh, the movie begins in, uh, in, the, in the ancient past, in the pre-human past almost, where we have hominids who are uh, semi-human, like the uh, Australopithecines and people like that, and of course they find uh, the monolith, and the monolith moves them into being human, and then on into the next, and then a monolith is found on the moon, and that then jumps ahead to the, to the flight to Jupiter. So it, I, I, I appreciated that very long span of time, which we often don't get a chance to consider. Eventually, I think all of those things that were in the movie will come about, but certainly 2001 is now history, and we know we didn't make it by that time. Obviously, the monolith is a, is a fictional, that's really science fiction. I don't think that's a, that there's any attempt to make that into anything that would actually occur. Uh, in terms of the social relations that, uh, that were d displayed in the movie, even the very advanced computer, the HAL um, computer and, and taking over, that's, of course, a, a trope out of fictional, the fact that machines will become smarter and will find us uh, irrelevant. 
Uh, do I think that's going to come true or not? That's not the question the futurists ask. We ask the question, is it plausible? Is it possible that it could occur? And there are some very well-known futurists today who are saying that those kind of computers, for instance, and that kind of long-term space travel to Jupiter, which, which was the last sequence of the film, uh, is, is entirely possible and indeed plausible and almost inevitable, but it will take a very long time to get there. The, the name for the, the machines, the, the computers that are represented in the HAL uh, computer in the movie, is called the singularity. It's when a machine finally reaches a state of consciousness uh, similar to human level consciousness. Ray Kurzweil famously wrote the book uh, called The Singularity is Near. He expects this type of event to happen within 20 or 30 years, extrapolating from the, from the possibilities that computers have today. So, and then we have the situation, what is, it, what is our relationship with another intelligent species on this planet? Uh, we, we believe that there is some kind of very rudimentary intelligences in some other animal species, but nothing uh, compared to humans. So if machines could reach a human level or near human level consciousness and intelligence, we would then have a very interesting situation where we had two intelligent species on the same planet. Uh, that would be so brand new that you could create any manner of scenarios. Will, will they be benign and we can work with them? Will they be dominant and will they find us, as Hal did, a nuisance and, and somewhat uh, uh, to something to be gotten rid of? Will they consider us pests and therefore they will try and exterminate. So there's lots of different science fiction and even now uh, future scenarios about what happens when, when and if that uh, uh, intelligence does emerge. So no, there's nothing in there that I would say other than the monolith itself, which is completely implausible. It would be interesting to have a machine, however, that was not quite so one-dimensional. So we always talk about characters who are one-dimensional versus uh, multi-dimensional. So more nuanced uh, characters, characters who have some flaws but some, some, some good qualities. And it would be interesting to have a, a, a little bit more, um, uh, let's say, substantive conversation between the man and the machine about what the machine was doing and why. It's just it's you know in the movie its mind is made up you're a problem you're not going you're, you're threatening this mission and therefore I'm going to leave you outside to perish um, the machine really did not justify itself it did not really talk about that the man did not def you know couldn't defend himself because there was no real conversation and I think having a conversation with the machines would be, from my point of view, more interesting than just simply saying, I now have the power, I'm shutting you out, we're going ahead without you, period, end of story. It's almost impossible to put timelines on these things. <laughs> I'm not going to make the same mistake we did about space travel in the 1960s. We're obviously advancing the state of computer intelligence and computers in general at a very rapid rate. Uh, uh, as opposed to Kurzweil, we tend to believe that there is some kind of uh, S-curve involved, a leveling off, where we will do just about everything we can do with the current uh, platform of technology, which is essentially digital, silicon-based computers. There's only so, so, so many um, of these. In fact, some folks are talking about the fact that Moore's Law might actually level off, that we've got maybe one or two doublings left in terms of the density of microprocessors on a chip or, the, or the, 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 how thin the, the wires are actually going to be. But after a while, you reach quantum level effects, which are impossible, at least current technology, to overcome. That said, there could be another round of computer technology, which is a completely different platform. People are working on quantum computing, which I, I certainly don't understand the theory of it, but the promise is that it, uh, it increases the capacity and the capability of information processing 10 or 100 fold, which then perhaps puts it within the capability of being able to be you know, fully intelligent. Of course, the fictional 
projects, I think, and I don't remember the plot exactly, but there was a movie around that same time called The Forbin Project, which uh, also indicated uh, computers that uh, that were taking over the world. There was a there was a, f a nice little movie called War Games, uh, in which computers started launching missiles, um, and that became a, a gigantic uh, nuclear threat to to the world as they began to take over. So a intelligent machine, uh, I don't believe, is impossible. And if it's not impossible, we might actually get to it someday.